52 GT3 cars on track at Monza start drooling now. Pre-qualifying underway here for the opening round of the Blancpain GT Series Endurance Cup. It is the pre-qualifying session at Monza, not to affect the grid, but to give the drivers more track time and to get everybody through into the race. If you have a problem in the qualifying period tomorrow, but you've done pre-qualifying, then you are okay. You've done your requisite lap. So uh, it doesn't affect the grid, but it does serve the regulations by people being able to do the mileage and go through into the race itself. We had free practice this morning, which was not without drama. We had a stoppage. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, this session is an hour and a half. You join us after we've had the uh, earlier Lamborghini Super Trofeo race and it's assorted podiums. So we're about 10 minutes in, but no real pattern has formed and not everybody has yet done a lap time. David Addison and John Watson trackside and inevitably it's a busy road and it is a Nissan Stuart Moore's car that is the fastest. But John, really at this point, people still don't know where they are in relation to everybody else because you're not on the same fuel load necessarily, you've got old tyres on, you're still working through a programme. And the thing that's rather surprising to me is you viewers haven't seen it, or you may have watched it on streaming, but the Lamborghini Super Trofeo race, which just preceded this, the fastest lap, and that was a 148.4, and the best we've seen after, what, 13 minutes of running from the GT3 cars is a 149.6. Now, either they're right for a lovely drive on a Saturday afternoon, or they're running really, really old tyres, and what does the pay? It looks like they're coming around. Is this that's oh, a full course yellow? yellow. Yeah. And what does happen? On track. There yes, is. and that's coming out of Lesmo two. Somebody has kicked up a, sh well, a real load of gravel on the exit. Uh, normally, when you do that, you turn sharp right and end up in the barrier. But it seems to have got away with it. But we've got a full course yellow. Uh, but still, even after what 13 or so minutes, mm. I th we're not within a second of what the Super Trofeo Lamborghinis were doing. It's quirky, isn't it? it it's it's. Let's put it this way, I'm trying to work out why. Other than everybody has gone out on a set of tyres that they would have run this morning on, which would have done the best part of an hour and a half, mm. to conserve tyres because obviously qualifying is what's important. No doubt at some point in this session, the, the people that are most likely to be in the front row or the front five or six rows will be on a fresh set of rubber to get a, an indication as to what to expect when we go into qualifying at the ungodly hour of nine o'clock tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, when it will be cold, cool, and whatever. It's going to be, going a to be, a next, be a strange grid. That's going to be my next question, because you're doing all this learning now in late afternoon sun, and then, as you say, we go qualifying early tomorrow. So track conditions, ambient temperature, it'll all feel completely different. Well, undoubtedly, it will do. It's information. The information that they're garnering now is relevant to what they will be doing when the race starts. A three-hour race, Sunday afternoon starts at a quarter to three. We are now 20 past four, so you'll be coming up to the middle, well, just over, a, just over the first hour, and these are the conditions they will be contending with come the, the race. So it's information regarding the race. This is not at the minute about going quickly on a single sure. flying lap. And it's also, isn't it, about, for some drivers, track knowledge, it's car knowledge. We just drew it more there in 22 Nissan. He's moved from a McLaren to a Nissan. He wants, understandably, as many miles in that as he can to get familiar with a different kind of GT car. Well, I mean, you can't get a lot different from what the McLaren is, which is ultimately the, the purest, if you want to call it, race car layout of any GT car, except, of course, the balance of performance keeps that in check, to the Nissan, which is the nearest thing running this weekend to what one might perceive to be a true GT3 car, very close to what you would buy if you walked into your Nissan dealer. Fundamentally, engine location, the whole waste, weight distribution, not dissimilar to the road car. Mm. Whereas the contemporary, the 2017 stroke 2016, the Bentley, the BMW, the Ferrari, the Lamborghinis et al, are extremely engineered within the regulations. So Nissan is waiting for its 2018 car to become available it may show its face a bit later in the year and Nissan can't come soon enough yeah because this is a venerable GT car now it's still competitive a mega road car oh absolutely absolutely yeah. you know barking man I haven't said that point at any of these and tell me it's not a mega road car because all of these cars are desirable and all of them are fantastic and you've got so many different brands represented I had a word with Stephen Kane after the earlier session. He said, we're not really, we, we, we're content, but we're not really sure where we are in the grand scheme of things. So the teams at the moment are trying to do their own thing. But 
it must be tempting and a bit distracting at times to sort of have a look at the times and see where other people are and, and, and almost get the wrong idea. Well, the thing you mustn't do as a team is sucker for that one lap on a new set of tyres and think we've cracked it, we've got the car where we want it. This is where all the homework is done. This is where the teams that know where they are in relation to their fellow competitors spend time. Oh. I was going to say metronomically. Well, that's not metronomically. Well, that's a strange place again. Why would you put a car off the track there? Nick Homerson, who is not inexperienced. That's the car he shares with Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini. And it's in the gravel at turn 11. He's, yeah, it looks... I mean, it, he's almost got it into the barrier, but because that car's not going to have to be pulled yeah. by the snatch vehicle, it'll be dragging half of the gravel trap with it because it's buried. You can see the car's almost up to the top of the... or the bottom of the rims. So this is going to take another maybe five minutes in total to clear not just the car from the gravel, but the gravel that gets then dragged back onto the track. He could stay to the left of that line, that defining line, and keep the gravel off the racetrack. But of course, sometimes racing drivers don't think about things like that. Here we go. Pull. He's got a long way off, hasn't he? Because there's quite a lot of tarmac runoff area there before you get to the gravel. Yes, there is a great deal of tarmac, and uh, I'm surprised that the car got that far off the racetrack. Mm. But anyway, we're getting it back onto the what used to be. This used to be an enormous. It's a bit like going to Brighton Beach. It used to be gravel as far as the eye could see. Now, due to regulations regarding Formula One, etc., that gravel bed has been reduced. It's now semi. What is tarmac in one part? And then eventually you get to the gravel, but the idea is to let's have a look and see. It might have been the aftermath because I thought I heard a, heard a squeal of tyres, but eventually he's already had the spin, hasn't he? Yeah, and that's done at Lesmo 1. Yeah. Anyway, there we are. In, in the good old days, he'd have taken down about 10 trees. Mm. So, gets going, no damage done. But watch for the gravel when he puts the brakes on. And he's driven straight back on track. Why not stay off the track and then put your brakes on? That's a big coming out of parabolic. Yeah, so straight into yeah, the pit lane. So straight into the pit lane. Yeah. So at least, no, now he's doing it. He's shaking the car. <laughs> Why is he shaking the car? Because I know I've got a shed load of gravel on board. And when he brakes, it'll all come rushing out the front. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. In days of yore, when Hugh Chamberlain ran GT cars, if one of his drivers went off into the gravel, they'd get all the gravel out, keep it, weigh it, and the driver had to buy the equivalent amount of beer to the weight of the gravel, and that was the penance. Hugh never had any taste, did he? <laughs> <laughs> he had a lot of beer. I know he had. <laughs> Especially with Aaron co-drivers. Now, while all that's been going on, uh, one or two people have been doing lap times, which is interesting, given a yellow flag out. And Fabio Cristari in the Orange One Team Lazarus Lamborghini has gone fastest, 148.978, ahead of Andrea Calvarelli, Lamborghini. And now they are split by Giancarlo Fisichella, who goes second fastest. The gap between the top two, 23 thousandths of a second. But still slower than we saw in the first session, which was, of course, time done by Phil and of, uh, it was actually Clement Schmidt mm. in the 75 Audi, a 147.8. So we are still 1.1 seconds away from what was achieved this morning. Now, that time would have been done on tyres, in my thoughts, that would be fresher than the tyre would be at this stage. This is a right-hand corner dominated circuit. And again, just watching the Lamborghini, since the slightly unstable as it came into the Ascari chicane under braking. So it is the left side of the car, predominantly the left rear, that gets hammered at Monza and in fact talking to a driver in the pit lane who said that we feel it's better to sacrifice a little bit of the car performance in the few left hand corners at Monza the principal one being the Ascari chicane the entry and the exit to be able to have a, a really strong car beneath us for all the important right hand corners and all the important corners on this racetrack are right hand corners so that's what some teams will be doing. That's their sort of thought behind it. We'll see where it gets them. I'm going to keep an eye, and when this session is over, I will disclose the source of that information to see okay. whether yeah. what they're doing has been beneficial for that team. We're getting a couple of cars being reported to the stewards for speeding in the pit lane, and... 
going to affect the times at all. It might make a few teams a few euros lighter by the end of the afternoon. This session is an hour and a half long. We've got 68 minutes of it. Still to run. Yeah, so we'll just got over the hour, and um, I'm certain at some point we will then, maybe within 20 minutes of the session, see the usual suspects go out and do a simulated qualifying run to get an idea of what they have got you know, in the tank. And I mean, in terms of tank, I mean performance rather than the amount of fuel, but they will probably carry the minimum amount of fuel they need to. But of course, in those three segments of qualifying, they start with the car, and then it, as the car empties over the three segments, it gets to its latest. So they will probably have the load of fuel in they would expect to have in for the start of that third qualifying segment. All very technical, and it's really where a team principal, a team manager, Mercedes just sliding its way through Lesma, one followed by one of the Aka cars. So they are, I think, looking in terms of the drivability about as good as I've seen from anybody so far this weekend. And if those were watching the first practice session this morning, I was picking up on a number of cars that looked particularly nervous or twitchy in some of the right-hand corners, particularly Lesma 1, also in Parabolica. And to go back to the comment I made about my secret source in the pit lane, those that look twitchy are the ones that are maybe trying to make the car work better in the left-hand corners than those of my mate who says, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to focus on the right-hand corner. Okay. So we'll let, let's have a look and see. We'll see yeah. Looking to see if anybody has got what I would call a slightly unstable or nervous car in some of the right-hand corners. Had one or two improved times. Christopher Hasser up to second. Uh, Clement Schmidt to third. Patrick Kuehler in the Pro Am Lamborghini fourth. Hasser is a Pro Am Audi. Pro Am could be quite a fight round here, I reckon. And uh, there in the background, you can see Benoit Trellouet eighth. The 08 on the car is the Luba Rank display. It's the overall position that's being shown. Used to be the class, it's now the overall. Uh, Benoit Trellouet in this car he shares with Antonio Berton and Stefan Richardi. For Trellouet coming out of an LMP1 car. You know, it is a culture shock. I mean, you get into a car that's got maybe 15, 20% of an LMP1 car. Weighs about the same. It's, uh, it's, you've got to re-educate your brain. You know, from braking and where you can, you know, or the speed you can carry through certain corners. If you were testing here last year in your LMP1 car, some of those corners would have been absolutely flat, no trouble at all. And probably coming through the first part of the Lesmos, and Lesmo 2 carrying maybe 20 or 30 miles an hour more at any given point than you could. There's a lot of debris in the corner yeah. coming out of Lesmo 2. Now, is that the consequence of, we saw the, the momentary yellow flag? It's a piece of astroturf, according to the message on the timing screen from Alain Adam, the race director. Ah, okay. We are getting an absolute best in sector one from Neat. Stephen Kane in the Bentley number seven. So stand well back. The blue touch paper has been lit, and Stephen Kane is on a mission. Is he on a new set of tyres? That's the question. I don't know. He might be. Let's see if he's... Is it worth it? Well, he's got to do it at some point. Yeah. And, you know, it, this is the point in the day when you're the, probably about as warm as it's going to get in the afternoon. So Stephen has gone out. Uh, fastest first sector, personal best. Second sector, tenth of what would be the fastest second sector time. Wait to see what he's going to do. The final sector, it should elevate him, I suspect, into a low at 1 minute 48. And he might even kiss into the 147s. But it's a little bit of an education for Bentley and Stephen Kane, who is the go-to guy, essentially, in the number seven Bentley. Good speed runs, just fractionally wide in the exit, but carries the momentum, picks up the slipstream from the Ferrari, which might give him a, you know, a hundredth of a so of a second. Comes across the line, goes quickest, 148.392. I said that in one breath. Absolutely, and that probably answers the question about the tyres as well, doesn't it? Well, because he's it two sort of does. Up on the rest. It sort of does, mm. but it's not as quick as I would imagine a new set of tyres would be. So you know, we, we don't know. We have to second guess what Bentley's done with Stephen Kane in the number seven car. How's eight getting on? Just by way of a contrast, that's what I'm really 17th in the sister car. 1.4 seconds. Now that 1.4 seconds, I would say, is essentially the difference here between a new and a used tyre, or close to it. You may well be right, yes. If you give Stephen Kane the benefit of maybe a couple of tenths of a second over, or maybe not even that, maybe just a tenth of a second on a single lap over Vance Abadou. Well, there the M Sport engineers look on. It's Malcolm Wilson's team, M Sport, but Matthew, his son, uh, tends to oversee the Bentley project. 
and there's still a ra oh, more debris flies. Uh, yeah. There's still a rally field to that squad, apparently. Mike Broad, rally co-driver and broadcaster, was telling me he went to Silverstone to watch the block pad endurance a couple of years ago. He got into the paddock, rang Matthew and said, I've arrived. Matthew said, come to the truck, the kettle's on. None of this, come to the hospitality unit. It was, the kettle's on, come and have a cup of tea. Proper rally speak, so Mike was impressed wow, by that. the Ferrari head, now that is a twitchy, nervous car, and that's not comfortable when you're a driver. If Stephen Kane goes one way, takes the line down, to the inside, so straight line speed, fractionally to the advantage of the Bentley, mainly because he was that much quicker off the exit of the Ascari, the Ferrari, the tail of the Ferrari, was trying to take control of the car, so that's why Stephen Kane was able to get past. Ferraris, traditionally at Monza, have got great straight line performance. I don't know what it's like dip near you, but up in Cheshire, in Atlum and Cheshire, you see a lot of Bentley Continentals on the road these days, and this whole ethos of go racing to sell cars seems to be working for Bentley because there are and a lot of them on the road. Is it true they don't have ferry dice from the interior <laughs> mirror? They've got a pair of football boots. <laughs> That's spot on, John. <laughs> I don't think they're all driven by footballers, but most, certainly. But you see a lot of them on the road. The point no, being, so it's a great car. It's a great car. Yeah. I and mean, then you've got the GT3 of the Continental, and then you've got the more, uh, how would you say, normal versions which are not as aggressive and they're a supercar this is the HTP Mercedes showroom one in another one in another one in 48 the man filter car Kenneth Heyer Hans Heyer's son sharing with Patrick Assenheimer and Indy Donger that's done good things in the last couple of years that's 26 which is now Christian Kelders of the wheel he's been given that car by Christopher Hasser and they dropped a third behind Gustavo Jakobin yeah, and Stephen Kane. Yeah, it's interesting, the 27, the Lamborghini. And I'm just trying to get, I can't get my head away around the name of this. They're Orange One Team Lazarus. Now, as far as I remember from my knowledge, Lazarus rose from somewhere. Yes. Well, they've risen Where they risen second. From? They've risen out of Lamborghini One Mate Racing. OK, well, that's an interesting thought. Over all these years, you've got to go somewhere to find a different team name, haven't you, really? I don't know. I've never been a team owner. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have a clue. Anyway, I mean, you can call it the obvious things, but that's certainly more of uh, the unusual yeah. than uh, we would see. There's the Raton Racing Lamborghini being negotiated by the Santalot Racing Audi. And the sister car... No, not that. I think the 75 car, the ISR car, mm. which was the quick car this morning. And Clement Schmidt, ex-Porsche racer, is behind the wheel of it. But it, again, this morning, I mean, whether it's relevant or not, but it was Audi's first and second, and Lamborghini third, Audi fourth, all with the same engine, different chassis in the case yeah. of the Lamborghini. So I'm, I'm surprised I, I, the Ferraris aren't doing better. Well, the balance of performance is undoubtedly an, an element in everybody's performance, and if suddenly we saw Mercedes so strong in Mizano, They've probably received some balance of performance adjustment. Maybe Audi have had a, some relief on their balance of adjustment. There's always a reason why Audi didn't have a particularly good race in Mazzano. They looked very strong here in the first session this morning. Where they'll end up when it comes to the end of the session and literally one hour from now. But Stephen Kane has laid a marker down for Bentley and Yakiman in the Lamborghini has done that in second place. So there is 26, Christian Kelders, experienced driver. Stephen Kane with a fifth of a second's advantage, but you look down just to show how competitive it is, and you've got Olivier Beretta and Michele Rugolo's Ferraris, and they are split by a thousandth of a second. That is how competitive this is. Wave, yellow flag, and is that a, an idea of Ferrari? Couldn't quite see what it was going slowly coming out of the second chicane, the Ruggia chicane. So that car, well, that'll make it back to the pits, questionable. The pace it's running at. 84, Maximilian Book is sort of the incumbent driver in that car. Frank Pereira has been drafted in. Frank Pereira outstanding there. The car has come to a standstill just on the exit of the Rugia chicane. Now, if it's 13, is that 13 or 19 on the display? Nine, it's 13. 13th. 13th is a McLaren of David Fuminelli. But 19th would be an Audi of Marcus Winkelhock, and I thought that was Audi-ish. It looks the headlights look more Audi-ish. Yeah. I think. So I'm, I'm tempted. It's full course yellow, by the way. Yes. So five ones crawled up to, 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 to right down. I'm tempted to say that's Winkelhock, who's not got to the second sector on his lap yet. 84 is Frank Pereira. 
in the Mercedes, currently only down in 37th, but uh, although that car's completed 12 laps, it's on its 13th lap at the minute. So we've got this full course yellow. Everybody has got to run at a delta time and keep a, a distance between the car that is following. Um, part of the new concept of, of keeping control in wave yellow flag situations and taking it away from the driver who might interpret what is meant to be a slowing down slightly differently to the clerk of the course. So this way it takes that conundrum out of the thoughts of any of the drivers. They've got to maintain a distance and not run under the gearbox or the wing or rear wing or whatever. There is a number seven Bentley. He's back into the pits. Stephen Kane has done his job. And who is going to get in uh, to replace him? Stephen walks away. Improvement also up to 10th place for the Zach Speed. Then Donus Rua Gelderkin, and uh, Baldadini. Uh, Rui Aguas has done Rui the time, Aguas, yeah. Portuguese driver. Yeah. He's another old stager, former, in fact, I think, I'm not saying Raining, isn't he? WEC GTE AM champion. But he's been around in Formula 4 and, and, and the like from the 90s, mostly in the UK. So, Bentley tops the times, and there's the sister car, which is 22nd fastest now. Still advanced on our at the wheel of it. So, will that be Oliver Jarvis or Guy Smith getting in? We didn't get a glimpse of the helmet clearly enough. There's the sister car, makes its way through the Ascari chicane. There's an argument to say put Guy Smith in, because he's not raced yet this year, so give him as much mileage as you can to get the rust off. Yeah. I mean, just a bit of track time and um, see what he can do. They're busy pit lane again. You can see the issues that teams have got in terms of trying to turn a car around. And in some cases, literally, that's what they have to do to enable them to work at it. And to the 44 taking up quite a lot of the space available. One of the McLarens, the Stracker Racing McLarens, was one of those cars had a heavy impact on the exit coming out of the Ascari this morning. Nick Leventis, the owner of Stracker Racing, just got wide, the car bit, and it just went straight into the exit of the tire barriers, did a lot of damage to the front of the car. Nick was taken to the medical center, then he was taken subsequently to the nearest local hospital. I think he maybe banged his knee. Right. Uh, yeah. In, you know, carbon fiber is exceptionally unyielding and a, 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 an errant limb flies around in the course of an impact. Carbon is so hard, believe me, I can still feel it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, Nick, who uh, came from historic and club racing, has developed into a pretty handy racing driver, but it was a fair old impact, just hooked a wheel over the curb. The car, we were told by Bas Linders, who is the sporting director at Stracker, he said it is repairable, but, but whether, whether, means, whether repairable yes. here or back at home is harder to gauge. Uh, the, the, the difficulty they have is they've got to strip the car right back virtually to the bare monocoque. Mm. Or the, in the case of McLaren, they call it a monocell. That's the, the pr process involved in, in actually constructing the monocoque carbon fiber uh, cell. So while you might look and see nothing, you need to go all the way through because it, it is a utility shell. It's not just a, a simple monocoque. Mm. So it's quite important to check the entire monocoque or monocell to ensure that there isn't any damage that's passed down the line and it, during that heavy impact. Sure. That's what I've out of eight. Driver change there. 55 minutes to go. Green flags way because we've gone back to full the uh, green flag situation. Full course yellow is ended. You see the little graphic at the top still has FCY, but we have the green flag symbol next to it. So we've gone green and people therefore can go at a proper pace once again. Full course yellow though works well for the officials, doesn't it? Because they don't have to stop the session. Uh, means that you can keep circulating, they sort the problem out and that people are released rather than having to lose time by coming into the pits, lose time by doing an outlap, you just get back up to speed straight away and off you go, it works well. Yes, I mean, it's one of the improvements that actually does work. Sometimes teams get frustrated with stoppages and red flags and you can't get a rhythm, you, you've got a, a work schedule you want to work through and you're being frustrated. So a full course yellow is a way to make that situation easier to control and at the same time maybe not quite so frustrating for teams as Frank Pereira makes his way through the second chicane uses a little bit of curb on the exit just getting the power transmitted to the rear wheels the 
car that stopped, incidentally, was the Dries Van Tour, Will Stevens, Marcel Fassler, Audi. It's one of the WRT cars. And the team Strange. manager of that being summoned to the race what, director. I, I wonder what caused that car. Normally those things are pretty bullet for Electrical. I have no idea. Yeah, it could be finger trouble, I suppose, but you know, it would be great to know what the reason for that car you know, bringing, being effectively responsible for bringing out a full course yellow. They can see the Mercedes and look at the inset oh, picture. That. That's the view on board. You can that compare is, and contrast. Well, that's fantastic because you're, you're actually riding on board with Frank Pereira and you're actually seeing then the, the, the view from the cameras around the racetrack. So there it is on board with 84 Mercedes, the car that dominated the three weekends ago in Nizano. Frank Pereira behind the wheel comes down into Parabolica, makes his apex, gets the car. The car is just so well balanced. Makes the job of the racing driver so much easier. I mean, when you've got a car that's with you as opposed to when you're having to struggle to keep it on the racetrack. So the 84 goes through, it's going to go on to its really its first flying lap of the afternoon altogether. Still done in 37th place. Still with traffic filing out onto the circuit. And we we'll just squeeze through before the like Mercedes wisely backed off to do this, nothing to gain by interfering with what Frank Pereira is doing and he's got a couple of cars a little bit ahead of him, most likely he'll not catch them until he gets close to the end of the back straight going into the Parabolica but, but well there's actually three of them, four of them, no three of them they might catch them a little bit sooner in fact so that's a frustration for the Frenchman to have to worry about where am I going to get past three of them, not just one of them Just Guy Smith is in the number seven Bentley. I just looked up quickly and I saw the number seven Bentley, and of course, the time was recorded by uh, Stephen Kane some 15 mm. minutes ago. There is the 55, another potential in our minds race winning car, great driver lineup. James Collado at the wheel, and I would think, correct me if I'm wrong, that's been about the best of the Ferraris all day. That's the one that's consistently been up there across the two sessions that we've had. Yeah, interesting, I mean, he feels the need to generate some sidewall movement in the car to get the heat into the tyres before he comes through the parabolica. And again, looks slightly, and I just call it fidgety, just the way it was coming to the final part of parabolica didn't look as planted as the Mercedes looks as an example. So, again, some teams try to use as much of the tyre on both sides of the car as the Mercedes thinks about slipping up the inside. I don't think James Collado is going to have anything to do with that whatsoever. First we've really seen of him in Brompham, but he's been a Ferrari stalwart in the World Endurance Championship for the last few years. So he knows the car, and you also know from the single seat of pedigree that he's going to be quick. What he doesn't know are probably about 95% of the competitors. He's won. He doesn't... He said, well, whose car is this? What's this? A Mercedes? I don't see that when I'm racing in WEC. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Johnny Adam about that yesterday and, and talking about going from one championship to another and the, the, the differences. And uh, Johnny, who drives the Aston Martin, of course, factory driver, was saying he's a bit of an anorak when it comes to all of this. And there you see the driver at work in the Ferrari. But Johnny goes out and researches who's driving what so he knows what to expect in given cars, goes out and researches the balance of performance so he knows what speed the cars are likely to be at. He, he goes off and does his homework, but he says there are other drivers that just rock up, get in, and drive around and, and don't do the whole team thing like he does. Well, that's a very thoughtful you know, approach to it, and I'm sure many drivers follow that. But I'm sure equally, there's those that are the, if you like, the more arrogant of our brethren, who just jump in and, and nail it, and they don't give a, a thought about who it is in that Bentley and that Lamborghini and that Mercedes Benz, because I know, I know I'm better than that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's so they're going to move, aren't they? That's the other approach. Yeah. James Collado into the Parabolica. You're watching him, you're riding with him, you can see him at work. Using all of the road, now starts to take the, the steering off, powering into a straight line. Over the timing line he goes now. Breaks the beam. That's a 150.1. He's over a second down on the earlier best lap of that car, but this session isn't all about time, as we keep saying. No, it's not. We are getting one or two improvements lower down. For example, 88 Mercedes, Daniel Junquidera, the Spanish driver, the nephew of Luis Sala from the Grand Prix racer. Uh, Daniel Junquidera has gone faster, 149.432 to go 15 fastest. And also an improvement 
And we're back to Ferraris now. Andrea Bertolini, the car was in the gravel early on, 53, but that's gone 17th now. One of our Jaguars. <laughs> yeah. As they say, our across, the, the across the Atlantic side. Yes. 114. Uh, that's John Hersey. Oh. Marcus Seedfried. Christian Kean. Team manager to race control immediately. They died at some little infringement. Has that car got into the top 40 yet? The Emil Frey Jaguar. We've got two of them, 14 and 114. No, 14 is 34th, but 114, the Christian Clean car, hasn't broken into the top 40 yet. So let's have a look and see what. Calado's have been overtaken by the Mercedes, or is he. Is that another Mercedes? Different shot, I think, isn't it? Because Calado's. It's not even Calado's, it's a different Ferrari. I just Porsche in the background. Where? Where? <laughs> I knew that getting excited. Uh, the Porsche, we've only got one, can you believe it? Andrea Bertolini has done the absolute best first sector. 53 Ferrari, the uh, largely black AF Corsa car with the Italian Tricolore across it, has done an absolute and a personal best. So he'll be coming out of the Parabolica in a moment. But 53 Ferrari could be on here for the top time. Andrea Bertolini reminding people how quick he is as the cars work their way through the second chicane in this little shot. You see the way as we get into the mid-afternoon, late afternoon, have a... Uh, trees now start to offer these great big patches of shade. It's so dark, the cars almost disappear at times. And has Andrea Bertolini gone over the timing line yet? As you ride with number two Audi, he's heading up towards the completion of the lap. Uh, is Bertolini, and he goes through 12th. Through, yeah, 12th. Disappointing. But, yeah, it started well. Well, I mean, being fastest in the first sector, personal best in second and third sector, I would have thought maybe it would have been a top 10 time. Mm not to be. And that's why I was looking to see where he jumped and uh, he didn't jump as high as I expected. Right, let's go on board again with number two Audi. This is the Benoit Trellue car. It's Natalian Berton at the wheel of it at the moment. It is to be found 10th fastest and he's not improved in sector one nor sector two. He's down a couple of gears. <laughs> Squeezing the throttle and then just letting the car follow the outside of Parabolica to keep the car as free as possible, no scrub of speed, and then maximise all that exit speed on this magnificent. If a straight can be magnificent, the straight That's at Monza it. is magnificent. It just goes on forever, doesn't it? Well, it's not that. It's because it's got this wonderful Tribune yeah. built when the circuit was first created in I think the late twenties. Yeah, there, there it is. And how appropriate its race number. Marketing brains have been out, and it's the 991 running in Pro Am of the Renault twins, Alfred and Robert, and Jurgen Herring, who brings some of the budget to run this car. Jaguar behind. Blue flag waves. The Porsche at the moment is to be found 30th fastest, and it is Jurgen Herring at the wheel of it. The Jaguar is certainly showing indications that it's got all the performance around the back of the circuit. Porsche does have good straight line speed and it is a frustration when you know that you've got a car that's quicker in a lap but where it counts you can't do much about it. And the Jaguar you're looking at is Marco Seafried, number 114, who goes powering past. So Seafried, who we used to see in Ferraris, now finding gainful employment away from Rinaldi Racing for the Lawrence Frey team. Uh, there's talk of a different brand being used come the end of the season by the team, so perhaps Marco Seafried planning ahead. Yeah, a good thing for a driver to think about if you want to continue an association with a good team and there's plans afoot, then if you can be a part of those plans, it's a good place to be. The team really has come on a pace. Two years ago, John and I were getting all excited about the first podium for the car at Silverstone. By the end of the season, it had won in the uh, six-hour race at the Nürburgring. And uh, then for the following season, Stefano Tully brought on board. Now there are two of these cars. And, OK, they're up against it with the might of the factories of Audi, of Lamborghini, of Ferrari, to name the three. But it's been so gratifying, hasn't it, to see the progress they've made. I mean, it, it, it follows, if you wish, the, the principle of the Nissan GT3. Mm -hmm in that it, 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 the Jaguar is very much similar to the, or what would have been this, if this particular model is actually no longer in production. So it follows that theme, whereas 
the more modern contemporary front engine Bentley Mercedes BMWs uh, are 2016-17 cutting edge technology I mean, if you went into a Bentley showroom and were shown this car and then shown the model on which it's based beside it you wouldn't know what I mean, there's, there are, they, fundamentally the body panels look the same but thereafter yeah, it's, a, it's a, a pure pure race car yeah, the, the, the shape is similar, but of course these cars have got all their aerodynamic aids on the big rear wing, so they do look different, yes. But there are close relations to GT3 cars, and they're watching it all. Oliver Jarvis nearest the camera. Stephen Kane has clocked himself. Hello, Stephen. The, the, the way that M Sport, and indeed Bentley Motorsport, runs its operation is on a, yes, they're here to win, but it's a good, friendly team, and that Bentley boy spirit continues. And at the end of every year, at the factory at Crewe, there are the Bentley Motorsport Awards, and they reward the driver that's made, for example, the best overtake of the year, or won the most races. They reward the teams, the customer teams as well, and there are all sorts of quirky awards. Uh, Andy Suchek won one, I think, last year for social media. And his well, the moustache of the year. Well, there was that as well, but the acceptance speech was not only hysterically funny, but went on forever, and he rises to the occasion. And, and the whole uh, way that Bentley, as I say, goes racing is, yes, they're there to win, but they've not lost that um, good, fun feel, and it's good to see. It is. It's, it's, it's sometimes more sport. Well, again, that little flick of over on the exit. Well, refresh again. But that family feel does get lost as everything becomes more focused, more professional. And if you can sometimes look at yourself and even sometimes laugh at yourself in the appropriate time, then good on Bentley for doing that. Lorenzo Bontempelli is the man behind the wheel of 51 at the moment. Another returnee to Block Pound. He's been a regular, virtually always in Ferraris. I can't think of anything else I've ever seen him driving. He shares with Olivier Beretta, yes, that one, and the Japanese driver Motoaki Ishikawa. And this car is 14 fastest. Lorenzo Bontempelli knows his way around the Ferrari, and boy, does he know his way around Monza. Of course, the big difference in Ferrari this year is we don't have any 458s, which was the naturally aspirated predecessor of the 488. And what you miss was the howl yeah. of a 4.4 or 4.2 litre high revving aspirated Ferrari engine, which was such a characteristic of the Ferrari. Now you've got the, the V8 engine still. Ooh, way, way wider. That's not something you want to be doing too frequently. But obviously being turbocharged is a more muted exhaust note. Who ever heard that story before? <laughs> I wonder where. It'll never catch on, will it? But this is the other beauty of GT3 racing. Uh, OK, engine notes do change, but there are cars of different shapes, different sizes and different sounds. Whereas if you were to take a Formula 1 grid, for example, and make them all the same colour, you wouldn't know which car was which at all. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a function of, of over-regulation. Yeah. But the beauty of a formula based on essentially road-going GT cars, albeit that they're you know, substantially modified, but they are distinctive in their shape. And I know if you painted a Porsche white and a 488 Ferrari white, I think it would be difficult to mistake one from the other. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's a Lamborghini, by the way. And that's one of the Barwell cars, 78, which is the uh, Leo Machitsky Miguel Ramos, Richard Abra car. Three good bronze slash silver drivers, three very quick hands there. And Mark Lemmer, who runs Barwell, no mean racer himself, of course, uh, getting on with uh, going for Pro Am honours this weekend, that's the target. Maxime Soule has gone actually fifth quickest in the number eight Bentley, so the gap between the two Bentleys is just half a second. So that's popped up in the yeah. last minute. So Maxim Soule, uh, last lap 149.2, previous lap 48.8, so it's half a second, just under half a second. Just under 40 minutes of the session remaining. But as you say, good for Bentley now. Yes, well, there. they're beginning to come forward. And with just say under 40 minutes to go, I wonder how long it will be before we see this mad dash with the, the new or the newest of the tyres available to get an indication as to what our out and out lap time could be and where would that put us in relation to our comp competition? Well, 
Lamborghini into the final. And what a great, I mean, why do we not have a racetrack with corners like Parabolic? I mean, but this calendar for the Endurance Cup does take you to some fabulous places. You've got Silverstone next, you've got Paul Ricard after that, you've got Spa. Indeed, yes, which Spa. Is a wonderful place. Smell the chips, that's what I like about Spa. That's decent beer around there as well, you know. This is down the... It's actually a greater decline than it looks on TV. The camera tends to flatten it up, and then you rise up as you come into Parabolica, and always you always tend to break slightly earlier than you really can do, because the slight incline does check momentarily marginally at your speed. But it's more important, actually, to get the car settled before you make your commitment to turn into the first part of the Escaria chicane, so that you then get the benefit through the change of direction to the right, and then finally have the car positioned to really get on it early and hard for the exit on the left. And that's where you will make up your time. The entry is important more from a positional point of view and a time point of view, but it's the exit that really will make a big difference. Just going back to that lap you mentioned of Maxim Soule as he crosses the line, um, it put him equal to the thousandth with Frank Stippel. So fourth and fifth in the classification, inseparable. They've done exactly the same time to the thousandth. And you couldn't really get two, two, two different personalities. No, quite different. One's French, the other is uh, German, but he's more like a Scandinavian, Frank. But you've got a, an Audi and a Bentley, so two different types of GT car, same time. Yeah, but owned by the same company. And that's you know, one of the amazing effects of uh, globalization. And uh, you know, both one runs a turbo V8, the other runs a, a V10, a sonorous V10. So 37 minutes to go as you look at 961. This is the Ferrari of Alex Demergia, Abby Eaton, and Davide Rizzo, winner of the opening, sorry, the second race at the opening weekend of the. Grand Prix GT Asia Championship, the new SRO series. We've got a yellow flag out somewhere, sector three. And they're approaching that in a moment. I'll go through the Variante Ascari. And then towards that yellow flag zone. Car 32 is in the tyre barrier, that's why. 32 is the Luca Ludwig, Emmanuel Vink, uh, Kevin Chekhov, Mercedes. And who was the man behind the wheel of it? It's Kevin Chekhov. Okay. New to GT racing. Yeah, done, and they were 40th, so um, depending how much uh, issue there is damage to the car, we can't see. Have you seen the car? I haven't no. seen it. He may have got going again. Ah, there we go. The 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 scary. Oh, he's way, way, way. Never had a chance, you know where, of getting around that. He, got, he must have got a massive overstick coming through the right hand part. And He's just, hit, does yeah. he keep it off the barrier or does he impale it into the tower wall? That's what happens when you get it wrong in the middle part. And that's why the entry to the chicane is so important to give you the right position to get your, the cut from the left back to the right, then to get back to the final exit. There it is, damage to the right front, and they're going to have to pull that car away. There is the snatch vehicle quickly on the scene. And Peter Zakowski will be already counting up the damage to the right front and uh, the spares man at Mercedes-Benz AMG will be getting a new part as we speak to deliver down to tax speed. So it said Luca Ludwig a moment ago, it is Kevin Check on behind the wheel and of course his incident, same part of the circuit but nowhere near as damaging as the Nick Leventis one from earlier on as he was in the gravel rather than being spat across the road. So that car will be hooked out of the way. It's covered by yellow flags at the moment. So uh, again, Alain Adam not wanting to stop the session or interrupt it if he can avoid it. And as long as people respect the yellow flags and slow down, let them keep going. Yeah, I mean, this is an opportunity for everyone to go back into the pit lane and have a conversation about what's happening. You can't really do anything meaningful when you've got a full course yellow. So I would just go back in the pits and uh, you know, reset what you're doing and think what would we want to do. No doubt many people are on a program which is, which is disruptive to that program, so maybe they'll continue. But mostly I would say get in, think about it and have a go again. So there is the Santalot car, 26. That's Christian Kelder's third uh, in the times at the moment, that car. 
I'm curious to see how that pans out in the race because it's been up there in the practice sessions largely because they've had Christopher Hasser in it who's done the lap time but I don't think Kelders and Mark Rostan are going to keep it up there overall and even in Pro-Am it might start to fade a little bit so it's, it's one of the imponderables this car at the moment to see where it will be at the end of three hours come tomorrow afternoon well certainly Christopher Hasser because I get your niece more than capable of giving the car loads of performance it's going back in so not much they can do at this particular time, so back into the pit lane. Yeah, Hassel is the one that will drive it, and uh, you can expect him to be the star in qualifying out of that trio, can't you? Yes. Over the timing line there goes Gustavo Jakerman, the Colombian driver in the, for short, Lazarus Lambo. Last lap, 152.0, some, what, 3.4 seconds away. From the time he set much earlier in the session. I think Crostani did the time early on, didn't he? So he's Could be, yes. a quicker driver. Yakiman really learning about the circuit. Yeah, well, Yakiman actually has you know, done a lot of LMP2 oh. racing, familiar with European circuits. I don't know whether he has raced at Monza and other formula, but certainly requiring to learn all about a Lamborghini here at Monza is the way the light now falling and uh, a lot of shadows being cast by the tribunes and the grandstands as you come down into turns one, two and three. Now 59 pressing on. This is the Jasmine Jafar, uh, Andrew Watson, Dean Stoneman, McLaren. I'm an interesting lineup of drivers that because you've got Jasmine Jafar switching from HTP where he drove the Mercedes last year, one at Silverstone for example. You've got Andrew Watson, young gun, who's staying for a second season in a McLaren but was at Garage 59 last year. And Dean Stoneman coming uh, into GT racing. He's had a year in the Carrera Cup GB, but then he went back to single-seaters, which was his first love. But I think now, after another go in Europe and another go in America, he's realised that the funding just ain't there. And no, Dean, it, back into GT cars. Yeah, I mean, I think in many ways, you, know, you, you can make a great career. And also, if you're successful, a good living. There's so much GT racing around the world. There are so many opportunities. And I've said this, I don't know how many times, but you many young drivers who have been frustrated, stalled or whatever with their aspirations to go in single-seater racing. Effectively, you've just got to get over it. And if you want to continue racing, well then, GT racing is, for me, the, the, the biggest growth area of all motorsport on a global basis. They had a spell in power boat racing whilst he was getting fit to go car racing because of you don't know the background to Dean Stone, but just when he was on the verge of the Formula One test drive, he was uh, struck with the most ghastly and malignant form of cancer and underwent horrific treatment to overcome it, which he did. And it's great that he's come back racing. And uh, although there were just one or two little after effects of it all, um, it's certainly not slowed him down at all. So the fact that he's out there racing is just great news. And yeah, he remains so very talented. Before he was had his illness, he was certainly a very much coming man yeah, indeed. Uh, of British motorsport. Came up Jonathan Palmer's Formula 2 championship. I like some of the categories. There's number 17, Audi, which is from Team WRT, Stuart Leonard, Jake Dennis, and because Robin Frins has hurt himself, Mark Finkelhock is super sub and gets drafted into the car. I'm trying to find any of the WRT fleet with a traditional old colour scheme. I don't think there are any. It doesn't look like it at the minute. I mean, certainly we noticed at Mazzano, the, the colours of the cars had moved away from the traditional little red, black, and maybe a little bit of colour to identify the nationalities of the driver. But now you, they've got a bonnet colour different on each of the cars, and some of the cars you know, do not look like WRT cars as we have known them previously. Jay Dennis, another one, turning his back to a degree on single-seater racing. He's doing a handful of uh, FIA Formula 3 races this year to help Carlin, to help these new drivers, but Jake now focusing on being paid, going racing. And 32 is back circulating after its uh, off-track excursion. Eight Bentley just rejoining the session. Andy Suchek now at the wheel. So uh, Andy moves out. Oh, well, what's going on here? Well, the Mercedes is making its way back. Yeah, it's got back so on. So it's managed to get back on the track. Damage fundamentally superficial, but uh, enough to put the car back in the garage and they would not be able to run gaffer tape on that. There's too much carbon fibre that is displaced. So that probably is not going to go out again. 20 minutes, just under 30 minutes to go. And I would be surprised if it comes out 
in the condition that's going into the pit lane shortly. Kevin Chekhov is the man behind the wheel. He will bring it in so the team can check on the damage and see how bad it is. 34th in the times is Christian Kleen, who is driving 114. This is number 14, Jaguar Albert Costa at the wheel, and he is 24th fastest. A lot of dust up at, again, the Ascari. Has somebody, another car, made a trip through the gravel, or is that just, it can't be the legacy of the Mercedes. The yellow flags, weather. So somebody's kicked up a bit of dust. Always important to have, as a driver, not just to look simply at the front of your car, but you've got to look down the road. And the other thing that's very important is the sense of smell. Because every organ in your body is so heightened by the, 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 the adrenaline rush you have. So if you smell, for example, oh, it's like my garden, my grass has just been cut. Someone's, Someone's been off the track. Not only have they gone off the track, they might have come back on again and dragged a hole of the grass onto the track. And grass is extremely slippery, um, especially freshly mown grass by a race car. Same applies to fluids on the track. You sometimes can get a, a momentary whiff of some kind of oil, gearbox oil or engine oil. Usually by the time you smell it, it's a bit too late. Yeah. But at least you, you know what you've hit. Yeah, true. Well, the dust settled as they're pushing on is Albert Costa, number 14, the Spanish driver. Swinging his way out of Curva Grande. 27 and a half minutes of the session to go. It's another jumbled order, but it's only at the end of tomorrow morning's qualifying session that we'll start to get any ideas about the grid. But with 52 cars, we touched on this in FP this morning, the free practice session, John, traffic is going to be absolutely critical. And if, if you're leading for about 10 laps, you might be able to get some clear road, but as soon as you start catching back markers, you're in it for the day. We're on board with the Jaguar. Is that a stationary shot from the Jaguar, or was it the camera's um, frozen? The camera's frozen, I think, because there's the car there, accelerating down to the, down to the Variante Ascari. The Jaguar's running not quite line of stern, but within about two seconds of one another. Car 888 spun and rejoined at turn nine. Car 888 reported to the stewards pit lane speed violation. Well, you should keep yourself on this timing and scoring. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily where you want it to be. 19th. 19th, indeed. Yeah, it's, just um, Jack Dwyer, yeah. who is the current driver. Off the road oh. has gone 15. That's a troubled Mercedes from Black Falcon. That's the Dore Japonic uh, Scott Hecker Brett Sandberg car. And the, the BMW as well. We haven't seen much of it today, but they've no. got the YM6 on the grid. Really have done with the two row racing BMWs to be here this weekend. Undoubtedly would have represented the brand as they've done so successfully. Again, just people just running out to the very outside edge. You need to be careful track limits on the exit of the second chicane. If it's abused too much will be something that will come to the attention of the race director. A little bit here in the exit of Lesbo too, you can run that sort of astral turf, we saw some of it have been ripped up and was lying in the circuit. And then the other place is obviously coming out of the Ascari chicane. Track abuse in the, the trouble is, oh, that's in the pit lane. Track abuse coming out of Ascari can often end up in tears. Yes, indeed so, as we witnessed this morning. Number two Audi, which was Stefan Rochelmi, has now become Nathaniel Berton. Getting ready to go, this is a WRT car. 35 BMW down towards the Parabolica. Which is quite a long way down in the times, I think, at the moment, isn't it? Frustratingly. The days of hordes of BMWs, and we have the Z4s, for example, long gone, but Rover Racing is a season entrant, but away at the, the Nordschleife this weekend, so that will be back to Silverstone as a team. Falcon Horse was trying to run two cars, but only one has been the outcome. Because, again, its sister car is away at the ring. Yes, obviously the importance for German teams of their events is significant. I think it's a great shame and if you're supporting a championship such as the Blown Power Sprint and Endurance Championships, I think it actually should be made mandatory that if you sign up for one, you sign up for all. We just had an improvement from Christian Kleen's Jaguar to go third fastest. 114 Christian Kleen has done a 148.6, that puts him 0.287 behind Stephen Kane's 
time topping mentally. Now, do you think that time has come from the skill of Christian Clean, or do you think he's got a better set of tyres on? Hard to call that one, I would say. Yeah. Both. It's hard to call that, I would say. I think Christian Clean has a huge part to play in that, because even with a new set of tyres, I'm not convinced that his co-drivers would necessarily get that time that he has got from the car. Yeah, on the Berman. I'm sorry, just, just click it. Gone. Number four, Mercedes, just to see where they are. The yeah, Alma Berman down in 16th place. Going back to Christian Clean, it is Clean, Marco Seafried, and Jonathan Hershey. I would say Marco and Christian are quicker than Jonathan Hershey. Yeah. So there's an element of it being the driver, but I think you're right, it's got new tyres on it. Well, it's got fresher tyres. I don't necessarily think it's got new tyres, but certainly I think the tyres would be not ones that have been pounded round all morning and then over just over half of this second session so sometimes teams might have a set of oh and suddenly all change at the top Alessandro Pierre Guidi goes second doesn't he 148.584 he's point one nine two of a second back from Stephen Kane there's the Jaguar Christian Clean work done he's now slowed right down you also saw Johnny Adam vigorously weaving around in the Aston Martin a moment ago coming down to the Parabolica so are we now heading in these last 22 minutes or so to a dummy qualifying session. I think everybody's got to... Oh, sorry. Those that are the pro cars, they've got to. They've got to go and see what is the ultimate time, albeit up to a quarter past five on a Saturday evening, which will have nothing to do with nine o'clock on Sunday morning. Nevertheless, they need to see what is the ultimate pace our car has. All the other work has been done to focus on race conditions which are going to be absolutely identical to those we're seeing right now. There's Pierre Greedy, but he's caught in traffic, so there won't be an improvement on this lap for him. He's just got past the Acura ASP Mercedes in the background. Davide Rigon has just headed into the pit lane, so also is Marcel Fassler. 22 minutes and counting, so the session heads towards its close. Somebody else is speeding up again, it's Christian Clean, so he had a calm lap and now he's pushing again well that would indicate he's got a, a, a reasonably fresh set of tyres he may have been in traffic and he would have backed out of it he didn't want to get involved in you know, trying to battle through so he's got a personal best in that first sector which is a, just under a tenth of a second off the fastest time of anybody so far then something in the second sector which two tenths down so Christian Clean if he can match the best time he's done so far, I'm on 48.6. I think that's about where we will be on this lap for the Austrian within the Jaguar team. Because he drove for Jaguar when they were a Formula One team back in the, the days of Eddie Irvine. As Alessandro Pierre Guidi, no improvement that time around. Uh, you mentioned Yelma Berman's name a moment ago. Well, he has just done a personal best in the middle sector in his Mercedes. Uh, Yelma has been remarkably quiet all day in the car that he shares with Lucas Stoltz, moving from Bentley, and Adam Christodoulou. Adam, part of the Nürburgring 24 hour winning team. And they've just gone up to 13th place. Indeed so. So Yelma Berman delivers. Second generation racer. His father was a quick GT peddler in uh, a Marcos, amongst other things. A what? A Marcos. Was it a wooden chassis Marcos? Not quite. It oh, that wasn't a real Marcos. It had moved on a bit to when no, Coral, no, no, no. But it wasn't made out of marine ply. It wasn't <laughs> no, a real was Marcos. Real Mar Herman Berman, his dad, he was a pretty handy peddler. Going back now, what, 17, 18 years. Pierre Guidi's on it, John, because he's done another personal best within sector one. And, oh, yeah. And an sector two. Sector two, yeah. Fastest overall. So, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, could this be the first sub one minute 48 second lap this afternoon we did have one this morning but only one so this could be the man and the car and it's a ferrari at monza and the sun's out there is oh and again Oof. again that sort of lack of certainty that prevents you from committing to getting on the throttle. i don't know there, what it is whether it's car set up or whether this the new tires we have for 2017 over the timing line now, where does that put in? Second. But he's now 0 0.020. In other words, 200 slower than Guy Smith. And but for running wide of the Parabolica, could have been different. He lost two tenths of a second on what was the fastest sector in Sector 3, down to Stephen Kane. So those two tenths of a second would have certainly put him quickest overall, but still not quick enough 
to get into the one of the 47s. He's working his way through the traffic still. Pierre Guidi at the next sector. We'll see whether he's still on it. He's still pushing. So he feels that he's got another lap in him. Is this down to tyres as well? What do you think? Johnny Adams has gone sixth. Yeah, you're saying yeah, by the way. The Aston Martin up into the top wow. six. 148.8. And that puts him just under half a second behind the, the quickest bend of the Stephen Kane time, which was set somewhat 20 minutes or more ago. So Pierre Guidi in sector one is down by six tenths. Forget it. Yeah, it's done. He's had the best of what he's got. OK, traffic is a factor, but uh, there's no point pushing any harder on this lap. So you can just, if you want to do, cruise back to the beginning of the start of another lap with Bentley running the number one, so number seven Bentley with the number one position. So it's showing Guy Smith behind the wheel, waiting to see when Oliver Jarvis will get in. And there's the Aston Martin in sixth place. Johnny Adam hustling on. The Scotsman who came out of one mate racing and then uh, after running out of funds he had a year in the British Touring Car Championship hooked up with Andrew Howard for something to drive and impressed and so John Gore who was running the Aston Martin factory programme against whom Johnny had raced in Renault Clio's uh, got him a factory contract and uh, well, was nothing, Johnny's never looked back. It was nothing to do with John Gore being Scottish as well was it? You don't think there was a little bit of nationalism in that decision. Perish the thought. <laughs> well, I think Johnny's um, proved he's deserving. No, he has, and he is there undoubtedly on merit, yeah. and he's been a stalwart to the brand and does a great job for Aston Martin. Based in Camberley these days, even though, as you say, he's a Scottish driver, and uh, work done. He brings the Tom Ferrier run Aston down the pit lane. How long are Aston going to be able to continue running Another variation on an old tune. It's a good question. Because there is a new Aston Martin coming on, which is going to have a twin turbo de Mercedes. Did I say Mercedes Benz twin turbo engine? Well, it'll be branded Aston Martin, but of it is course. going to be sourced from AMG, I believe, right. in Germany. That'll be an interesting little package. Not ever. And now you see how busy the pit lane is. The Aston is a one car operation and it squeezes into the gap. There's Ahmed Ahafi with his. Distinctive overalls, the Amani driver standing by, Johnny Adam gets out, and there's just room to swing a Bentley. You have to be on good terms with your neighbours, particularly when it comes to the race, and you know, what you try to do is work within both people on either side, say, well, we're going to come in and maybe lap, or no, we're going to come in at, on the hour, for argument's sake. When are you coming in? Now, some teams will not want to get that information up, but some teams, it's not so critical. But you need to have a good working relationship, otherwise, and we've seen this happen, your cars literally get stuck, they can't yep, get out. Yeah. Ferrari, no, yes. Lambo facing the wrong way, yes. that's the 77 Martin oh, Codridge car. Yeah. Patrick Cuyola did the time early on. In the Ascari chicane. Yeah, but he does not want to be sat there, it's not Cuyola, ignore that caption, that's just the first driver listed, the man in it is Martin Codridge. Awkward place because you can't see the cars that are going to turn into the chicane until they're literally on top of you, and he's now trying to drive against the flow of traffic, which is never a great idea. And this is not pretty. This is not what I had hoped to see. Now, reversing back, and you're going to see even less. Yeah, and the car's bearing down on you. I mean, that is a case, again... Full course yellow. Full course yellow, yellow indeed. Yeah, because it would only take a few seconds in real terms, wouldn't it? Just give the guy opportunity. Come on, Martin, don't let us down here. Don't, don't back don't, into no, the no, gravel. No, don't go in the gravel. Oh, I hate, I hate, sorry, seeing a car in this situation because there's somebody who will be... Oh. And there we go, over the gravel on the inside. Oh, that there will be waved yellow flags at yeah. the entry to the chicane. And that Lamborghini, I don't know which of the Grasso racing cars it was. I think it was Portolotti. Well, he didn't appear to heed the, the flag. Yeah. So, 63, was it? Yes, Portolotti was right. So he was the um, errant driver. Hey, hey, it's no problem. Well, he got away with it. But that's... Well, he may not get away with it. Well, as in no contact, but yeah, the, the stewards might want a word. I would, I, would, I would say, I would want to know, why did you have to go over the gravel on the inside? Yeah. Hey, hey, how often do you have to hear these AAs? 
to know that it's not the AA, but it's AA. Which shade of yellow are you struggling to comprehend at the chicane? <laughs> so, uh, can I offer you a Porsche moment? Because Alfred Renauer has just started to do good sex times in the 911. Marco Mappelli, who's a factory Lamborghini peddler, has gone 30th in 66, the Attempto car. And we've got that, 13 and a quarter minutes to go. And that 66 car was bang on the pace of Mazzano. Yeah. Pole position for the Saturday evening race. Now, is there a balance of performance element there? Or are they just sitting back, doing their homework, and then when it really matters, they're going to nail it and just go and prove that number seven, which has now got Oliver Jarvis in it, is not the quickest car on the racetrack. Well, it's not, because the best lap time he had this morning was from the 75 Audi with a 147.8. A lot will change. Some of it might happen now with 13 minutes remaining, but tomorrow morning, believe me, a lot will change. 72 Ferrari, Davide Rigon, has done a personal best and an absolute best. He's 21st fastest. He's in the last sector. It is looking like a very good lap in the SMP Racing Ferrari. I'm waiting for him to go across the timing line. But Davide Rigon is looking all of a sudden as though he's about to put that car way, way up the order. He's not yet got to the timing line. As into the pit lane heads one of the R8s. Waiting to see the SMP. That should be it coming into the shot now. Fastest. Goes quickest of all. A 148.381 by 11 thousandths of a second. Davide Rigon then up to the top of the times in the car he shares with XDTM racing Miguel Molina and the Russian driver Victor Scheiter. Wow. Ferrari Bentley, Ferrari Lamborghini, Jaguar, Audi, your top six. Funny that two Ferraris now just showing their form coming to the end of the session Saturday and afternoon. Wonder why. And a Lamborghini's up there as well. Good. Good for the local news. Jaguar is still in fourth and fifth place. Yeah, that, that now with Jonathan Hershey, yeah. probably, but he won't be yeah. as quick as Robert Ford's Crystal no. Clean. No, but that's still it. The Jaguar is hanging in there yeah. before you get the first of the Pro Ams. 26 and Standard Lock Racing Audi. Felix Serrales, the Puerto Rican driver, ex single seater gun, uh, is in 88 and being warned about driving correctly at the chicane in turn one because I think he's been at the escape road a fair few times. And so the race director now has given him a warning about making sure he stays on the circuit. Patrice Van Four, seventh quickest now in the WRT Audi. That was a good lap again on his next lap, personal best, first sector. Davide Rigon, personal best, first sector as well in the SMP racing car. That's a team that we've seen in years past in Blancpain, but good to have the Russian squad back. And there is the now second placed Bentley, Oliver Jarvis, uh, new to being a Bentley boy this year. So uh, part of the Audi family. And his father, a very quick Formula Ford racer, came back a long, long time. Like Clive Lovett. Multiple champion of Snetterton was Carl Jarvis. So into the pit lane goes Oops. the quickest car. And oh, the level knees. 961, where is that on the racetrack? Hard to see it. First chicane. It's a great one coming out of the first chicane. Strange, strange place to lose it. But obviously, maybe he just got as a consequence of coming out. Of the second part of the left or right left. Uh, so anyway, just a quick flick around, but no damage done. Dries Van Four has further improved up to fourth, quickest now in a lap of 148.498, within 0.117 of the fastest lap still held by the Ferrari. That's pretty close to the top four, isn't it? I mean, that's a blink. Yeah. Nothing more than that. 14 Jaguar pushed down the pit lane to the team. That might even suggest run out of fuel and coasted in and needed to be pushed back to the team, potentially. But Stefan Ortelli was the man at the wheel of it. And they don't look concerned, necessarily. Nine and three-quarter minutes to go. Goes on the little dolly jacks. Gets spun around and taken into the garage. Davide Rigon started his next lap quickly, but has bailed at the end of it. Yeah. it. I mean, he got a personal best, but obviously in the following sectors, nothing, and uh, he decided quite rightly to get it in. Mm. So the last driver to make any significant improvement was Dries Van Four. Although Maxi Book has gone 17, he's just improved. 149, 104, you might say 17, so what? But when it's this competitive, because at the moment, 
It is the leading Mercedes. 25 cars covered by less than a second. It's competitive, isn't it? Oh, is it ever? And this is only pre-qualifying practice. Mm. That lusty V8 in the Mercedes just drags the car out. Last year, the race turned into a, a battle didn't it, in the last stint between mm. McLaren and Mercedes. Yes. McLaren here, nowhere. And that was Van Ginsbergen. He's having a torrid time yeah. at Phillip Island, having lots of tyre issues, as many others at Phillip Island have been having this weekend. But back to the action coming into Parabolica. And the usual problem just getting so many cars so close together. There's the 55, which had been and has done in 13th place right now. Marco Cioccio at the win, 23 Nissan behind, that's the Alex Buncombe, Captain Masaccio and currently Lucas Ordonia the car. Last year's endurance champions, or the other uh, two-thirds of last year's endurance champions, Rob Bell and Colm Ledegar, 26 at the moment, Colm Ledegar at the wheel of the car uh, that they share uh, with uh, Ben Barnicote. I tend to think that well, last year it was garage 59, now it's track racing. But that car with Rob Bell, I'm, I'm sure the performance is being held back mm. because they, they're doing the work. They know when they put the new set of tyres on, they can get the grid position that they want to look back at the Nissan all the way around. Parabolica coming out about 150 miles an hour, 250 or so kilometres per hour. Then a big, big break, and it's you know, we've had a beautiful afternoon here at Monza. Ambient's been run about 22, 23. Be a different day tomorrow if the temperatures are the same. Concern will be if you're involved in running close with other competitive cars, brake temperatures and brake wear. I don't think we've ever seen anybody having to make a, a pit stop in this three hour event to do a pad change, let alone a disc change. But it, it's something that, again, as the heat will increase, so will the load on the brakes become, for some people, critical. Six and three quarter minutes still to run. As you see, 23 Lucas Ordonia pressing on in the newly delivered motor bat Nissan. And that's the view from the headlight camera as he blasts down the straight. Traffic up ahead. Oh, I do love it coming down that back straight. Always you know, tried to break so late, but at the same time rotate the car. Just uh, there's a photograph of a car I raced here many years ago, and it, it just epitomises for me a the corner because the photographers were on a high podium looking down and they got a, a, a sort of unusual angle, but it just summed up what the parabolica was as a as a racing driver, and that's a great memory to have. And the circuit had to be changed a little over the years, but still. Keeps that great character. There's certain parts where you can't change it, you're stuck with what you've got because of the topography. So, the fastest car in the session is currently number 72, the SMP Racing Ferrari. Miguel Molina is at the wheel of it now. And Oliver Jarvis at the wheel of the second fastest car, the Bentley, then Michele Rugolo, Dries Van Thor, Nicholas Pola having a go in 27, and Jonathan Hershey at the wheel of the 114 Jaguar. Looking down the field, 18th place, Maximilian Book. Mm. Seven tenths of a second down in 18th place, a personal best time on that lap in the second sector. That was his best lap. Um, curious to, to see what the BOP is for the, the Mercedes following that dominant performance that we saw in Mizano? Or are they just being uber, uber clever and cautious and not showing their hands? If you look at the 44 Stracker McLaren as it makes its way through Parabolica. It's David uh, Fuminelli at the wheel. Yeah, just to see where they are. 25th. Yep, they are. So he'll get two more laps out of the session if he wants them. And on that lap, so it's 25th. More and more heading for the pit lane. So I think the start are going to call this a session just a little bit early, achieve what they need to do. Johnny Kane is one of the three drivers in the 44 car, and uh, he's got a pretty busy schedule between 
racing in Europe, racing in North America, backwards and forwards. I think the first time he gets a break is the week following the sprint round at Zolder in Belgium in the early part of June. Yeah. Part of June. The 40th quickest is the Porsche, Robert Renner, now the wheel of it, G by 24 hour winner this year. The sister car 58, Colm Lidegaard, made a small improvement up to 25th. Yes. So it's always better to be going that direction rather than the, the arrow, the red arrow pointing downwards. Car 22 reported to Stewart's pit lane speed violation. That's the other Nissan, isn't it? That's the that uh, Matt Simmons, Drew and Moore and Matt Parry share. Matt Parry, former GP3 racer, BRDC, McLaren Autosport, uh, Young Driver of the Year award winner a few seasons back. There is the car. And I understand from my fifth columnists within the Nissan team, they're pretty impressed with what young Matt is doing. Potential. Yeah, he's somebody that, despite his abilities, never really grabbed the headlines for whatever reason. The press hasn't latched onto him. He's not been that fashionable a driver. But, uh, yeah, he is certainly talented. And another one now looking at a different career path to try the single-seater route. Got quite a number of the BRDC McLaren Young Driver of the Year Award winners on this grid. And uh, Matt, one of them. 22 there at the moment has got Matt Parry at the wheel. And he's up through the Lesbos. Well, the British Racing Drivers Club has been stalwart in supporting young talent but they support a number of drivers and some people feel well is that should we support one or two and try and get them into what is now formula two and maybe into something even greater or have a, a wider base and get them to a particular level and then sort of set them free to do what they can do for themselves Travel 7 is the Team HB Racing Bernardelle Giovanile Lamborghini. Come Lidegaard is further improved up to 19th now. Again, that most likely would indicate there's something slightly fresher, something hanging off that Ferrari as it comes down. Part of it is a Lamborghini back part of some of the trim. That's the wheel arch extensions has sort of become detached. That's the Delhe and uh, Vanille car, isn't it? So, a minute and a half remains. We're almost at the end of the day. Almost at the end of the session. And then the good news for the teams is that apart from one slightly dog-eared Mercedes, there's not that much work to do overnight, from this session at least. No, this has been a relatively trouble-free session. A couple of little harmless spins, a couple of trips into the gravel trap. It's the McLaren team, or the, the Stracker team, that have got a massive amount of work and they've got to strip that car right down before they can even consider rebuilding it. Travel 7 has had an incident that's also involved car 55, which is the Chiocci Fisicala Collado Ferrari. Travel 7 being the Lamborghini we've just been talking about with the trim hanging off, and that's under investigation, the little incident between them at the first chicane. Robert Renault's Porsche is up to 30th. It's about the only significant improver in the last few minutes after Kermit there is 72, which is Miguel Molina at the wheel of it. New for block pan for this year, the big numbers on the windscreen. Just to ease identification along with the Lumirac display, so that during the course of a session or a race, you know where that car is in terms of its position in the classification. So you can follow it on live timing on your smartphone, and then the cars also tell you where they are on track with the uh, flashing Lumirac display. Five seconds. That's qualifying. We've had Lamborghini racing qualifying, so and also T Sports Club. So the twenty qualifying. Qualifying session gets under nine. Category 12 years of age. I mean, they're not. They're at least the drivers there. Talk to the pit. Right, yes. Comes pit stop. So Jarvis pit in. He's taking the flag. Sort of thought a great deal. In fact, it fulfilled a uh, very fresh. I made this weekend. Okay, was having that. Uh, Let them 
Thanks. Christian Engelhart, Marco Bortolotti, Andrea Caldarelli, only 18th, but ahead of Ericsson Pereira and Book with Ben Barnicoat, Rob Bell and Colm Lenegar, reigning champions, struggling a bit in that session to be 20th. Keep on going. Best of the AMs, 888, 31st fastest, was the Marco Zanottini, uh, Jacques Di Driver and David Perel Ferrari, run by Kessel, ahead of 32 that we saw uh, being pushed into the pit lane, the Emil Frey Jaguar. Max van Splinteren's car being 33rd ahead of the other Barwell Lamborghini. And a long way back, Jake Dennis, Marcus Winkelhock, Stuart Leonard, Audi. 961 after a couple of dramas, ending up 43rd, the Alex Demirjian, Abby Eaton, David Rizzo, Ferrari. But an awful lot of Mercedes a long way down, aren't they? 40. 4th, 45th, 46th, 47th, keep on going with some star names there. 46th, Edo Mortara, Michael Meadows, Raffaele Marciello, suggesting that a lot of teams were to coin a phrase, keeping their powder dry, and we've not yet seen the best of them. And the one that never went out, of course, 42, uh, the damaged McLaren of Nick Leventis, Craig Fleming and Lewis Williamson. So that's the order at the end of the pre-qualifying session. And to have a look at some of the highlights, it began with a busy road with Bentley, hustling on and uh, Stephen Kane doing the first driving chores in number seven trying to get a good time out of that car when it was time for Guy Smith to get in the hot seat Stephen and Oliver Jarvis looked at the uh, television pictures we had a full course yellow whilst an Audi was hoiked out of the way that being the faster Stevens Vantour car Marco Ciocci, James Collado, Giancarlo Fisichella's Ferrari was one of the quick ones early on and then Nathaniel Berton Benoit Trillier and Stéphane Richelme's Audi started to creep its way up the order. But in the end, only to 22nd. Frustration there. Jaguar versus Porsche. Not a Group C battle of old, but a GT3 battle of today. On track is 89 almost. Came a cropper getting in the way of 75 Audi down at the first chicane. Pressing on and almost getting into the back of the traffic ahead was 58. The Stracker car of Ben Barnico, Rob Bell and Kerm Ledegar. Triple three was also looking competitive with Renat Salikov doing some good lap times towards the end of his time behind the wheel. But as the session wore on, Michele Rugolo in the 50 Ferrari got on with the job and started to work that car up the order. He was at one stage second fastest, although the time in fairness done uh, by Alessandro Pierguidi, and he could have gone better, but for a wide run through the Parabolica. Johnny Adam then started to light up the screens in the 97 Aston Martin. He got into the top six before handing over to Ahmad al Hafi in the crowded pit lane the Armani driver taking over. 77, Martin Kodrich had a spin and was just avoided by a rather errant Mirko Portolotti, who arrived, Harry Flatters at the chicane, the very anti Ascari, as Alex Demergian fell off the road at the first chicane and got going again. Katsumasa Chio, Lucas Ordoniev and Alex Buncan battled on in number 23, 24th they were by the end of the session, as 51 GT3 cars ran to the end of pre-qualifying, the times topped by Davide Rigon in this car, the SMP Racing Ferrari.